expenses to less than 6%. So much so that the program was written about in the Journal of Surgery, one of the leading medical journals, because it was preventing kids from motor vehicle crashes. So, um, and we also have the very first diversion program, which is something I sought for a long time. Grant was allowed through the district attorney's office um, because I had an issue with kids who would hit a parent in, the, in an argument. And as you know, arrest is mandatory in a domestic. And so these kids would be arrested. So we set up a diversion program where we have a counselor in court meet with the parent and the child and agree to three months of intensive services. And when they complete those services, the child is never arraigned and never has a criminal record. Because it doesn't make sense to pit a parent against a child. This program has a 95% success rate, as do our other diversion programs. They're available to many kids. Um, almost all misdemeanors are diverted since the juvenile justice law came into effect. We divert um, many of the um, many of the misdemeanors in our court through the clerk's office, through um, uh, uh, assistant magistrate Laurie, and through our our wonderful clerks and assistant clerks. Um, so that it's pretty rare for us to see anything other than really serious felonies now. Although I will say in Worcester, you know, there's a huge uptick in firearms and shootings cases, um, and we're dealing with those. And of course, those cases are not diverted. But for the most part, we work really hard to keep kids out of court to prevent the collateral consequences that exist once they have a criminal record. Can felonies be diverted? Yes, some felonies are diverted. You know, you have a first, uh, a first offense, and it's a felony because it exceeds the amount like a malicious destruction property over 1200 because a lot of damage is done in a, a building we we still divert some of these felony cases it's a first offense the kids never been involved with the court do we really want to have a, a a criminal record so we can divert them the district attorney's office is great in worcester and will most often agree but even if they don't agree now that judges have the authority to divert what i do if it's a felony, sometimes with misdemeanors, I refer it to probation for what's called a diversion assessment. And probation looks at the family and the child and whether the child has, you know, any problems in school or has mental health issues. And then they make a recommendation to divert it. And then we divert it and put services in place for that child on the diversion program. And um, our diversion programs in that respect are hugely successful. These kids rarely come back and they really escape the collateral consequences of having a juvenile record. This is a priority for our court. It's a priority for attorney Laurie. It's a priority for our clerk magistrate. So if they, if they complete uh, whatever requirements are put on them, uh, for whatever period of time, at the end of that time, the complaint is dismissed. But prior to arraignment, to arraignment. so that they never, so that the, when a, a when a, a carry record is pulled up, it doesn't even show that the child was arraigned. You know, it's good. We bring the parents into it. You know, we work out these diversion programs um, with things that these kids can do, and uh, we've had tremendous success. I mean, we have an extremely robust diversion. Uh, diversion programs in, in our county, and we're lucky enough to have judges who are all in agreement with it, and magistrates and assistant magistrates who fully support it. And many of these cases I never see. Um, a lot of times, um, Attorney Laurie comes out to, I sit in Milford one day a week, and that's a, a pretty busy court, and um, many times she handles the magistrate hearings there, so I see very few arraignments there. She, you know, works out diversion program, works with the local police who are in agreement with us for diversion programs. It's been very effective. You know, we're really proud of it. Is, uh, is, it, a, is it up to the uh, a clerk or assistant clerk or a judge as far as who gets diverted? Well, if it's a, if it's a, a show cause hearing, you know, which of course is on misdemeanors, if it's a show cause hearing, it's completely up to the clerk and the assistant clerk magistrate, and the judges are fully supportive of that. You know, we trust our magistrate and our clerk magistrate. We we all know what, how important our diversion programs are, so they can make orders. They say, okay, if you're not in trouble for the next three months, or you stay out of trouble and you're not coming back into court, and you do this program, <clears throat> And then, especially with our teen ride program, which is now coming back up and running after COVID, the magistrates 
most of the cases that are referred are never even arraigned and um, and are referred by the clerks to the program. And then we keep track as we did um, to in order to get the statistics for the doctors to submit the to submit it to the Journal of Surgery and Trauma. Uh, and they compared our numbers to the number uh, to the number of kids that had been in crashes in in Springfield and the diversion rates in Springfield and the diversion rates in Springfield were you know significantly higher. Um, just like ours were before the program, but you know, having a 5% recidivism right now for a program like that is, I think, unprecedented and having a diversion, having a domestic violence diversion program, getting kids services and meeting with the parents and mediation and never bring and never having them have a domestic violence charge on their record. I think, you know, promotes exactly what we need to promote with kids in the Commonwealth. Yeah, thank you very much. Any questions? So Thank you for calling on a counselor. I want to tell you, this is such an honor to have you here. And I have said this before. Sometimes we have a witness and I ask, you know, have you ever seen this uh, nominee in court once? You have it all and you've given us a lot of information. And I know I get a lot of calls that judges and the juvenile court. So I have been asking, I know what people are asking, so I'm very pleased by this nominee. Tell me, what do you think is the, the greatest strength that this nominee will bring to the court? Well, as I think, as I mentioned in, in my remarks, she has a lot of strengths, and one of those strengths is she has just the, the temperament necessary to be a juvenile court judge. I mean, temperament is really important in juvenile court because you have to connect with kids every day. So one of the things we're seeing a lot now in our court and some of the runaways is that these, these kids are being sexually exploited while they're on the run or sexually trafficked. I've had kids who have been trafficked to other states as far away as New Mexico who have been on the run in our court. And for, for, for us, and with her very wonderful temperament, you have to connect with these kids to get them to trust you so that they're not going to run when they walk out of the court. And, and so connecting with kids every day is something is a true strength that she, she has. Um, and aside from her experience, and as I said, in Worcester, where we have UMass Medical School, um, just recently I've done cases on children who have needed heart surgery, brain surgery, tracheostomies, this, you know, medical medical issues are, are big in our court. You have to have the kind of experience that she has having done care and protection cases and worked with children to understand to understand the substituted judgment process. But I, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, as you heard, you know, just the courage it took for her to, you know, come into our court, you know, within days of her husband passing away and dealing with a child that has those medical kinds of of issues has given her um, a perspective. You know, we, we've had some medical cases in Milford recently, and she, she and I have talked about just the serious issues that this, for example, one particular child would, would go through. Her own personal experience with her child is, is just crucially important to really understanding that. But her temperament is just the kind of temperament you need to, to sit there and look at a kid and say, tell me what's going on. What, what's going on at home? Can you talk to me about that? And then to ask the question that we always ask, and that's you're hearing a lot of stuff about you. Tell me something good. What are you good at? Only to hear kids say, I'm good at music. I'm good at art. You know, it's just an important part of our court that doesn't exist in other courts. And, and uh, you know, Attorney Laurie clearly has those abilities. Well, thank you. Your testimony means a lot to me. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. As always, I appreciate it. Twenty years. So <laughs> it's a lot of lot of time. Years, Twenty years. I voted wholeheartedly, <laughs> and you've made me proud through the years. Someone's Councillor Devaney. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, Councillor Kennedy. Uh, just following up on the diversion thing, there was two things you said that threw me off a little bit. One was you talked about it being if it's a first offense. Why does it have to be a first offense? Well, oh, it doesn't have to. Oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't have to be. I'm saying that's sometimes we get kids on a felony and it's a first offense. 
and then we say we're going to divert it. But no, we divert we divert a lot of cases after a affirmative defense because sometimes you have a kid that has you know a record of minor offenses. You know, like it's not serious. That's what concerned me. If it's then oh no, no. Like let's say let's say there's a second case of, of a kid and it's it's a property case. It's not like a a, a case where there's like a, a personal victim, and it's a you know break and entering into an abandoned building. You divert gun cases. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because we can we can work with those kids. Um, the second thing that hit me when you were talking, and I was paying attention, um, the um, when you talked about clerks diverting them that they were misdemeanors. They're not all misdemeanors in clerks hearings. Right. You found these too. Right. And the issue with felonies, as I think you you know, is that. Um, especially with the recent standing order that came out um, after the Wallace W case, um, and I think I it, spent a lot of time in juvenile court. So yeah, well, there was of course a case uh, over the last year or two, the Wallace W case, which which allows which by the SJC under the new juvenile justice legislation interpretation, that results in the automatic dismissal of uh, autom the automatic dismissal of misdemeanors. So let's say you have a child who's charged with breaking and entering and there's a felony charge there and then and then there's a resisting arrest or a disturbing the peace. The disturbing the peace, for example, will be dismissed under Wallace W under the interpretation of dismissing certain case types. And then there's the fem sorry. Prior to oh, yeah, prior to definitely prior to arraignment. Um, and and sometimes and so the case will come in and the prosecutor says uh, right up front, Judge, we're dismissing, um, we're dismissing the dis disturbing the peace be uh, on, on Wallace. And then there's an evaluation. If the child comes back, the court can look back at whether the child has other charges. So let's say there's a felony combined with a, with a misdemeanor. We can divert it, but under the rules, a police officer has to check the box to say that a clerk can divert a felony. Otherwise, a felony cannot be diverted. And um, I, Why is that? Be, because that's the. That made, makes no sense to me that the police. I have a lot of respect for the police, so, you know. But it makes sure. no sense to me that they should be able to make that call. Right, and that's the law. And um, Judge Frain, who will testify, just he was on the committee that just wrote the rules for judges based on on the Wallace W case. And you know he can clarify even more. But my reading of the new rules, which I just read yesterday because we just got them. Um, this week, um, it's always been up to it's. It's always been that the police check the box. One thing our magistrates do, even if they don't check the box, is they would say to the they would say to the police officer, "Is it okay if we divert this, or is it okay, um, you know, if we, you know, uh, we'll make the probable cause finding, but we want to divert it and not put it in front of a judge?" And the police officers would agree, even if they didn't check the box. I'm not sure. At this at this time, counselor, whether we still have the ability to do that, Judge Prane, I think can probably tell you that. But yeah, no, he's you know he did a wonderful job of just with the committee. But I think, and I'm pretty sure, just having read the rules once, that it's you st we are going to it's going to require. I'm not happen to not be in agreement with that, but that's the interpretation of the SJC that they're going to require the pol the, the police to check the box and. And uh, magistrate that makes zero sense to me. Police, yes. police are witnesses in the case. That's what they are. Yeah. Well, how, why is a witness making decisions about whether somebody can be diverted? Whether it's a, you know what I mean? I, I, I fall for a clerk, yeah. assistant clerk, or, or a judge. Yeah. I, I happen to agree with you one hundred percent. You know because you know my goal in my court has always been to keep kids out of court and to divert kids from the court. I, I've been in front of a lot of clerks over the years. We all of them, one point or other, but you know, and I some of them will listen to the police and not defer to them, do what they think is right. And other ones will look at the police and say, What do you want? and they'll defer to them. And I, that always puzzled me. That's not a neutral habit. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen the form, um, on the report, you know, and the you know, the clerks that are here, and I, attorney Lowry can say. There's a little box on the top, you know. I'm sure you've seen it because you've been in front of clerks, and that's what we're dealing with. And I think one of my concerns as the new rules come out, and I have to read them again, as I said, this is very recent, 
but as the committee just released the released the rules and it was uh, the the rules have been confirmed by the SJC and approved but I think my reading of the rules is that it's not giving clerks as much authority to divert these cases. However, what I do want to say is even if the clerk has to bring the case to arraignment, the juvenile justice legislation allows a judge, which didn't happen before that legislation, to say, I'm going to divert this. And that's what we're doing. So it can come in front of me and I can say, OK, this is in front of me. I get it. It's a felony. We're dismissing the disturbing the peace because it's a it's a misdemeanor and it's the first misdemeanor. So that's off the, off the table. And then I'll say to the prosecutor, do you want to go forward or can we divert this? And many times the prosecutors say, we're, we're OK with diverting this. But if they say no, we want to go. If they say no, then what I say is, well, as you know, the juvenile justice legislation law allows me to make that decision, whether you agree with me or not. And I think this case is appropriate for diversion. If, I, if I'm not sure about it, then I'll refer it to the probation department and say, can you do a diversion assessment? And they'll do a full assessment and send it back and say, we agree with you, judge. We think you should divert it. So there are a lot of, a lot of options. To, it, there, the options are open, even if, it, even if the interpretation is it's not open in the clerk's office for a felony, if they don't check that box, it's open to me. And it's something I use a lot. Just makes no sense to me, but thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Oh, Dr. Paulo. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. It's good to see you. I just want to thank you for all your advocacy to get this seat filled because we both know we've been. Thank you so much. We both know we've had lots of conversations. It's a long time, right? So it's good to see you this morning. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's good to see you too. So let me let me just ask you. Um, you have the power to overrule the police officer that says they're in a disagreement. Yes, under the juvenile justice legislation. A neutral and dis, uh, uh, objective clerk cannot. Correct. At least that's my interpretation of it. Um, I know that the clerks work with them, but my understanding of is it's always been that if they check that box, and I think with the new standing orders, and again, I apologize because I just got the standing orders yesterday and read through them and they're substantial. And I have to say, Judge Frayne and that committee did an amazing job of interpreting complicated, very complicated cases of Wallace and Nick, very complicated. And my understanding from the, the standing order is that it, it gives cl clerks little authority to do that unless they can say to the officer, you know, we're, we're asking to do this. I will say we have an outstanding district attorney's office. So a lot of times the prosecutor will you know, have talked to the police officer and they'll check that box. But, you know, the, the thing is, I think most juvenile court judges feel the same way I do. If it comes in front of you, it's important for us to know who are you and, you know, what, you know, why, you know, what brings you here to really look at that and say, you know, I really need to give this kid a chance. I don't want to give this kid a, cr a criminal record because, as you know, one of the major problems with kids is then it prevents them from getting college it prevents them from getting college funding. It prevents them from getting some certain types of scholarships and federal funding to support them on whatever they do, even if it's a vocation. And it also impacts them. If you're if you're a kid and you go to a voc school and you're a plumber and you know you finish the plumbing and you want to get your license after you do an apprenticeship, that's going to come up. You know so. And so why should they have to face that? I don't think they should. So that's well, here, here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Let's assume uh, uh, the clerk, clerk Moran, wants to divert somebody in the police office, says, no, I'm against it. <laughs> and he says, OK, I'm going to divert him anyway. What can a police officer do about that? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the police officer would do anything. Well, not so much they do, yeah. but what can they do? I would, well, I would imagine the most they can do is appeal it to a judge. That's exactly So it mean. gets appealed to you, let's say. You, you are correct. You then can say, right. well, it's now in my lap and I can do it. Right. You are correct. The finding of, the, the, the finding of, of a clerk uh, the finding that a clerk makes would be appealed to a judge. So, um, so there are times when there, for example, there's a probable cause finding that a lawyer gets assigned, and a lawyer, not not even doing the Benedetto case, not even doing, you know, I'm going to hear this kid be, be arraigned. 
No, they they can they can appeal. They there's there's an appeal process um, that goes to a judge. I've only done those a few times, but um, you are exactly right. That it, it absolutely can happen that way. I mean, one thing that would happen is if it if it came to me and there was an appeal, you know, on the finding on the finding of a of a clerk. You know, as I would look at it the same way as I would look at any case, you know, where, where I would say, not, it's not a challenge. It may not be a challenge on probable cause, but it's a challenge. Um, there are other challenges. So let's say they challenge probable cause and I'm looking at it saying, no, nah, there's probable cause, um, but, but I think this case should be diverted and I'm going to divert it prior to arraignment. I can still do that. So the fact, you know, the, I think the best thing that happened in the last several years was that the Juvenile Justice Reform Act gave judges a lot more authority to divert cases even when people don't agree. And, um, and, and I think as some people know, we also have been given a lot of authority to um, actually hear a probable cause motion under the Umberto H case prior to arraignment, which was huge because prior to that, kids would have to be arraigned. That would give them a criminal record. And then there was, then the Umberto H came, to, came down and said, you know what, a judge can hear, a judge can hear the issue of probable cause and make a decision that's in the best interest of the child and within the juvenile justice system to hear the motion. I actually hear motions prior to arraignment, which is which was a huge thing to happen for judges, because otherwise these kids would be arraigned and only then could you hear what is called a deep end of dental motion and you know. I think it's incredible that a police officer invested in the case would be able to overrule a neutral and dispatched uh, clerk. That's incredible. Right. We agree. At least we have options though. At least I have the option to divert it myself. So Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in. Um, the Honorable Brendan Morin, Clerk Magistrate, Worcester Juvenile Court. Thank you, Councilor Juvenville. Good morning, Councilors. I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank uh, It's only been about 15 months since I last saw you, and I want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity of a lifetime to become the Clerk Magistrate of the Worcester County Juvenile Court. Um, but we're here today for Clerk Lowry. Um, and in my honest opinion, I don't believe you're going to find a more qualified candidate in the Commonwealth, particularly when you factor in her temperament, legal acumen, and work ethic. While I would hate to lose her in as, as an assistant clerk, she's more than ready to become an associate justice of the juvenile court. By way of background, I first was introduced to uh, Clerk Lowry back in January 2021 when she interviewed for an assistant clerk's job in my court. Prior to that, I had no knowledge of Attorney Lowry. However, in the interview, she easily separated herself from the other candidates with her engaging personality, clear passion for working in the juvenile court, and her work experience. She was the unanimous candidate of the committee, which included two clerk magistrates, a judge, and an office manager. But as you all know, an interview itself is not enough. When I started contacting her collaterals and references, again, the feedback was unanimous. Whether it was a defense attorney, a DCF attorney, a clerk, or a judge, Everyone spoke of her hard work, legal knowledge, dedication to her clients, and temperament. Since she started in our office in March 2021, Julie has excelled at her role as the assistant clerk magistrate. She has proven to be dependable, hardworking, and has exhibited a consistent willingness to learn all aspects of the court. She is well liked by staff and litigants, and she has quickly adapted to the little quirks that are unique to Worcester County. Her extensive knowledge of the junior juvenile law and procedure has proven invaluable to both clerks and judges alike. She's compassionate and she understands the idea that everyone who comes into our court has a story and it's our job to understand that story in order for us to understand that. She has excellent communication skills which are on display and she's consistently able to explain complex legal issues to our juvenile litigants. Whether it's assisting with a personnel issue, working with an angry individual, or the count, or at the counter, dealing with an um, angry, uh, presiding over a emotional magistrate hearing, Julie has always maintained an even keel. Her temperament might be her best attribute, and I know Judge Erskine um, mentioned that as well. But in my opinion, um, this council has a lot of nominees who come before you who have the legal knowledge and experience, and I do think temperament oftentimes separates many, many of the good judges from the great judges. And 
Julie has exhibited since day one a temperament that will easily translate to the bench. She has spent an, almost her entire 20 years of legal career in the juvenile court. She understands the barriers our clients and victims face, including socioeconomic issues, mental health issues, and substance abuse. Specific to Worcester County, she understands the challenges that we face post-COVID, particularly the backlog in cases. This is someone who can get on the bench tomorrow and assist us. I mentioned to you 15 months ago that I don't believe anyone in the court, you, you won't find anyone who cares more about juvenile court, or at least Worcester Juvenile Court, than me. And that's why I'm here today, to support her nomination for the next Associate Justice of the Juvenile Court. And I would ask that you vote in favor of her nomination, and I can't thank you enough for the time. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, so you just heard the discussion about... Yes. So... I know you're a very good clerk, and I know uh, from personal experience, you put a lot of thought into making sure young people do not get a record. So faced with what we just spoke about, how would you handle that? So I can tell you practically, it, 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 very rarely am I, so I've been, whether an assistant clerk or clerk magistrate since 2014, so we're eight years on the job. And I can count probably on one hand how many times I wanted to keep something at the clerk's level and the officer said no. So, and practically speaking, it's a very rare circumstance. Unfortunately, um, to Councilor Kennedy's question earlier, there is case law on it. I, I believe it was a Suffolk County case, late 90s, which basically said that the clerk has no discretion if the officer wants to go forward. With that said, can you have an office conversation with the officer? Of course. And, and I have to say, again, my experience is more times than not, um, they're in agreement to keep it at the clerk's level. Um, they may ask for additional conditions, um, but very rarely have I found the case where an officer has said, no, we have to go forward on that. Generally speaking, either it's a very severe case or the kid has a wreck, or this is not the kid's first time. Very really, and, and again, we're talking about assault batteries, dangerous weapons, we're talking about larcenies, we're talking about vandalism. It's probably the most common one we see in terms of a felony, which people don't realize is a felony. Um, and routinely, the officers do ask for a hearing. So I guess if I was in your shoes as a clerk, I don't know what you would do, and I won't put you on the spot asking you. I felt strongly enough that that complaint should be diverted, and he would not check that box. I would say, I'm going to divert it, take an appeal. And, and again, I, I, you know, I've been appealed once, and that was on a CMVI, um, but you're right, it would go to a judge. Um, the good thing about that, too, is if it goes to the judge, and depending on, I assume if the judge issues it, then they're precluded from hearing that case going forward, too. So um, I wish I could tell you what the answer would be, but I've never been in that situation because I think more times than not, and I think that's where like, someone like Julie's personality came in because she has the ability to work with people. And I think more, a lot of times you could find common ground with the officer. Um, you know, one thing I've done in the past um, is maybe you keep the felony at the clerk's level and you may issue the misdemeanor. So if the officer is that adamant about going forward, sometimes you could say, okay, if there's a felony and misdemeanor, how about we keep the felony at the clerk's level so the kid, it's not, I use the phrase Jacob Marley with the chains around you for the rest of your life, that's the felony. Um, so um, that's what I've done in the past. And again, a lot of times they've been amendable and, and I've dealt with most of the police departments in Worcester County. Um, whether it be in district court or um, in juvenile. So that's another technique I would use, counsel. Assuming that there's a misdemeanor, maybe say right. compromise. Thank you very much. You do a great job. Keep it up. Thank you. And thank you again. The Honorable Brian Frain. Fran, is I pronouncing it right? Frain. 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 Irish name, you told me. I did. I'm up right now. Associate Justice of the Lowell Juvenile Court. Again, good morning. I'm Brian Frame. Tell me what you do with that question. Well, and I'm an associate justice of the Middlesex Juvenile Court, and I sit in Lowell. I have not been back to this room since my own hearing back in March of 2020. Um, and I think my hearing may have been one of the last in-person public events before um, everything shut down. So it's been a challenging two years, but it's great to be back and great to see everyone in person again. 
Um, it is my privilege and honor to come before you today on behalf of Julie Lowry regarding her nomination to the position of Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Juvenile Court. Julie and I became colleagues in the Norfolk County Juvenile Court when Julie began taking cases as a bar advocate back in 2005, 17 years ago. Um, we worked together in Norfolk County um, until I left in 2020. Uh, from her beginning days in the juvenile court, Julie demonstrated that she has the unique skill set to be successful in the juvenile court. I am proud to know Julie both as a trusted friend and a top level talent of both delinquency and child welfare law. I'm not here today to summarize Julie's impressive resume or qualifications. However, it is very important to stress that Julie has succeeded in so many different roles within the juvenile court. I know you've heard about a lot of them this morning already, but you know, Julie's solo practice covered both juvenile delinquency and care and protections and CRAs. And there aren't that many practitioners that can handle both the delinquency and civil arenas of the juvenile court. And there are even fewer that can do so both at such a top level of skill and expertise as Julie. In addition to all the trial work, Julie also kind of bookend her juvenile court practice by taking juvenile court appeals, working as a GAL, doing revocation hearings for DYS, and she's basically found every way to analyze the issues before the juvenile court that one could do as a solo practitioner. And I can tell you that I'm one of many people from the Norfolk County Juvenile Court that could have been invited here today to speak for Julie. As Clerk Moran said, um, Julie has the, the type of work ethic and reputation that from their fellow bar advocates to assistant district attorneys to DCF attorneys to probation officers to clerk's office staff um, to the judges that appeared she prepared for in Norfolk County. Any one of those people would have come here today to talk about how well liked, how hardworking and how smart and how skillful what Julie was in the juvenile court. And I'm honored to be the one that you know got to be here today to kind of you know sing our praises to the work that she did as an attorney with me for all those years um, in Dedham and Quincy. Throughout her years as an attorney, Julie was an incredible asset to her clients. Again, although she had exemplary trial skills, her work as an attorney went far beyond the courtroom. Julie's empathy to her clients' obstacles and commitment to helping them solve their real life problems is unmatched. In order to have her young clients achieve positive life outcomes, she would also advocate for needed services and supports in the community. Filling the lawyer's role as both litigator and counselor, Julie's always found ways to advocate for her clients to win on two fronts legal success in the courtroom, and then life success outside of the courtroom. In addition to the value that, to the families that Julie brought during her years in the Norfolk County Juvenile Court, she was also a huge asset to the court and the court community. I also had the privilege of serving with Julie on the Norfolk County Bench Bar Committee for several years. And through this work, you know, Julie for many years was the chairperson of that group, and she listened to the concerns of the court and the needs of the bar, and was very giving of her time to solve those problems. If there was a need for a training for the attorneys, Julie would not only organize it, oftentimes she'd be the one presenting the information on a panel and, and helping train the lawyers. Her commitment to the families of the Commonwealth included enriching the bar. She understood that the better prepared and trained the lawyers were in the county, the better results there would be for children across the board. Julie is that attorney that was always available to share her knowledge and expertise. My practice, uh, was primarily civil in nature, focusing on care and protections. But if any one of my clients ever was charged, picked up a criminal case, or had a clerk magistrate's hearing, Julie was always my first call. She was so willing and always generous to help out any of our colleagues. It's, she's the type of person that if any attorney was working on a motion late into the evening and you emailed or texted Julie, she would email you over you know, a memorandum of law or some samples to look at. Julie's also the type of person that after her cases were done for the day, She'd sit in the, in, in the bench in the Dedham Juvenile Court or in the attorney conference room to make herself available for the new attorneys who may have questions about you know, legal strategy, where to find a form, anything. She was always available to the new attorneys who were coming in to practice. I think it was important for Julie to make sure that the newer attorneys had a good experience, were set up for success, so they could, because she knew how important the practice area was. And also, I think as many can relate to, Julie was that person, that if someone showed up at two o'clock on a Friday afternoon to remove a warrant, the court would call Julie because they know that she would get in her car, she would come down, she would sit with the child, and she would do a great job on short notice. Like me, Julie Lowry is a juvenile court lifer. She has dedicated her practice and her career to the juvenile court. And this dedication will serve her well to become a judge of the juvenile court. She has the specialized experience and qualifications to succeed as a justice in the juvenile court. 
her legal practice for, seven, for 17 years, as well as her last year and a half as assistant clerk, makes her the ideal candidate to be confirmed as a judge and hit the ground running. I can speak from experience a little over two years in that there's a steep learning curve for new judges, but I know that Julie is certainly equal to the task and will quickly become an excellent judge if confirmed by this council. Selfishly, I asked this council to confirm Julie so I get the opportunity to work alongside one of the best in the juvenile court business again. And more importantly, confirming Julie as the next justice of the juvenile court would be a huge asset to the court. She brings years of experience as both a trial attorney, appellate attorney, legal mentor, guardian ad litem, and assistant clerk magistrate to the bench. But most importantly of all, confirming Julie as a justice to the juvenile court would be an amazing benefit for the family and the children of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, you. you as well. No, I, and you know, I was thinking when you came through, you became a judge in the most difficult time in the history of the court, really. Not how you managed it. I know you're here for the nominee, but I've got to ask you that. I will say it was when I started, I, you know, I was confirmed in March. And at that point in time, that was back when everyone said, oh, we'll hold off on your start date for a couple of weeks until this dies down. And then, of course, I waited. The, I, I started in June of 2020. And I will say that when you join the juvenile court, the 43, 44 other judges immediately reach out, want you to be successful, are so supportive to get you up and running. And everyone was very apologetic about, I can't believe you're just starting. You have to do this over Zoom. You have to do this over the telephone. But for me, I have to say, I didn't know anything different. No, I so, I, so everyone's like, oh, I, wait till it's like the wait. That's just a norm. Right. And everyone's like, well, when it's, when it's like it used to be. But I didn't know what it was like. So I, I kind of learned how to do that. So when I started, we were doing stuff on speakerphone. Yeah. And then it went over to Zoom. So in some ways, it was a good way to, in hindsight, it was actually a, a good time to train because it was, it was um, in between cases, you know, I could turn my Zoom camera off and like text someone a question. It was so, so, so it, it worked out, you know, and now that it, it's things have gotten more in person and more back to quote unquote normal. So it's like the best and the worst of times. Yes, yes. So I, I really um, appreciate your statement that you have such a knowledge about this nominee. So you really have worked close and, and really know. And that means so much to me. I don't want someone sitting there that just, you know, barely knows the person. So uh, your testimony means a lot. And thank you for your service. No, happy to do it. Thank you very much. Yes, Councillor Duff. I just want to say thank you for a comment that you made because I think we forget because we're all on Zoom now. But when this pandemic first happened and we had to do meetings, we were doing them on the phone. And we actually had to do a hearing on the phone because we didn't have any other way to doing it. But we didn't know what was going to happen. And I think it's, I, I think you just put something into historic perspective that we've just lost perspective of. Um, and I appreciate you, you mentioning that because I think it's quite important that people understand, um, you know, when this pandemic hit us, we didn't know what we were in for. We weren't even employing these technologies. You know, speakerphone was the best we had. And my, my, that we knew to use, right? Yes, and my hearing was in person, but my vote was over the telephone. Right. It was like March 8th. It was literally right. I think the building was closing down around us when I was here. We had to hold one hearing on the speakerphone because we can because the courts are so desperate for personnel as you know you know this this seat's been empty for so long and it's our duty to get these you know as soon as we get the nominations we like to get them filled uh, because it's not fair to the to the citizens but it's also if we'd left those seats open during the pandemic it would have been even more catastrophic and personally I think the courts did a phenomenal job navigating something that we've never seen nor anticipated. So thanks, you know, for for your participation. No problem. <laughs> your participation notice today. Perfect. Councilor DePaul. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I know if I were to ask the previous witnesses that we don't have enough lawyers practicing in this area in Worcester. Is that consistent with your experience in Norfolk or anywhere else in the Commonwealth? So I will say Norfolk County seemed to be um, lucky in the sense that Norfolk, because it was a little bit smaller, there were a lot of attorneys that would do Norfolk County and Plymouth or Norfolk County and Boston. So, that, you know, 
after I left private practice, I worked for CPCS, and Norfolk County was one of the few counties that never had a problem with, with getting lawyers to take cases. It, it, it seemed to be one of those uh, outlier in that respect that there were always there was never any, we never had delay hearings. There were always counsel available in Norfolk County. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm sitting in Middlesex County as a judge, yeah. we are seeing that more and more. Um, that it's hard it's hard to attract lawyers and it's hard to keep lawyers. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of anecdotally when I talk to people around the state, Norfolk sounds like the exception. Yes. Yep. Um, what do you think can be done about it? You know, I think what, you know, from my experience, I did a lot of training at CPC of the new lawyers. I was often involved in the training of the new class. And yeah. especially, I, I think the problem usually lied more with the care and protection and the civil side of it. There seemed to be, it was never really a problem to get the bar advocates because there were a lot of adult criminal defense attorneys who would also do juvenile for it. So the real need seemed to be in the, in the care and protection side. And I, I, I think one of the things that CBCS has done over the past few years is they've fought really hard to get a, a better a better hourly rate, rate, rate for the attorneys. And, that, and that's helped some of it. Um, but I think some of it is also, you know, there seems to be a lot of the recent law school graduates are kind of in the metro Boston area. A lot of the need is out west, Worcester, Springfield, Pittsfield. And so there was, it, it, was, it was very hard to get people to go out that far to work. Do you know what the trainings are like to to get on the care and protection panel? Yes. And so to, to get on the care and protection panel, you have to apply. It's a, it's a pretty they, they have a screening process. We have to, you know, base there's a couple essays as why you want to do this work. And then the training itself is usually, um, it's I think it's about two and a half weeks broken up over about a month's period of time where the first por por portion is a lot of, you know, lecture and group work. And then the end of that training is they actually host a, a mock 72 hour hearing, which is the initial custody hearing for children. and. Right. And they work on that for about a day and a half and have to do a full hearing from start to finish. And the attorneys aren't compensated for the two and a half weeks that the training takes on. No, not the, the staff attorneys would be, but the, the bar advocates are not. not the bar. And actually, they have to pay to attend it. So. Right, they pay to attend it and give up more time. Yes. See what's happening. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for being here this week. No problem. Thank you. So, uh, the issue of uh, diversion. Yes. What's your thoughts on it? So in Middlesex County, we have the district attorney's office has a very robust diversion program. And district attorney Ryan will, anything that she can attempt to divert, she will divert. And so for for us, we don't even see that many even come in to the arraignment stage. They, they come in for the first date. Usually what happens in due course is they'll say, we want to do it our own district attorney diversion screening. Can we have a, a three week to a four week date to see if we can come up with a program? And then most times they come back and they've they've come up with a diversion program for the juvenile. In the cases where they either can't divert or aren't willing to divert, um, and then I have a similar practice where if someone's moving for judicial diversion under the statute, um, it'll many times if it's one of those cases where if it's a either a felony or a more serious misdemeanor, um, that's when I will also use the statute to ask probation to do the the two week screening to kind of meet with the juvenile in a sense of. Again, for me, it's not just whether or not to divert, it's once they're diverted, what does that mean? Is it just don't get into trouble for the next 90 days or is it what kind of program you're going to do? Because I feel an obligation that not only just to, I think it's wonderful to divert and have juveniles not get a criminal record if, they, if we can avoid that. But I think it's also is equally important is to give them the tools and the support to make them not come back. Like I don't want to see someone. I don't want to. I don't want to have a conversation about should this be diverted a second or third time. I would like to somehow try to get some services in place to try to give give these young people the tools to kind of avoid the system altogether. Um, many years ago, the juvenile court had jurisdiction over juvenile murder cases, and I think it changed in the early nineties. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have the last juvenile murder case ever tried in Massachusetts with Judge Kantrowitz. And in those days, a guilty on a juvenile murder was punishable by, I think it was 15 years. And a second degree murder was 12 years. Uh, I thought it was a pretty good system, but the times being what they were with a lot of juveniles committing very serious cases that got a lot of publicity. So the legislature took the power of the juvenile court away from 
murder cases, gave them to uh, the disciplinary, the superior courts. But my, my opinion of the juvenile system, I go there, I don't go there a lot, but every time I go there, I am, uh, I'm really, may, not amazed, but I'm really inspired by the dedication I see in that court by judges, clerks, uh, probation officers, uh, court officers, all for the protection and help of children. It's, it, it's really an amazing feeling when you go into that court. I also think it's one of the hardest places to be a defense lawyer or a DA uh, because of all the moving parts you have to go through to you know, get the case resolved or try the case. Uh, so I, I find it to be a, a, one of the hardest cases to have as a juvenile case in my view. So I take my hat off to those who, who go there, take all those cases. And, and uh, everybody in the court, I've never met one person in juvenile court that, that ever said, you know, this is a lousy job, I hate being here. It's really a, an inspiration when you go in those juvenile courts. So, so keep it up, whatever you're doing, your judges and clerks, it's, it's a happy, happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no more uh, witnesses for, any witnesses against? No witnesses against, uh, we will hear from the nominee. Thank you, Councilor. Good morning again. I'd like to thank Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito for the nomination to the juvenile court. I'm extremely honored to be here today and am humbled by this entire experience. I'd also like to thank you, the Governor's Council, for the opportunity that you're giving me today. And I thank you for the time spent with me prior to today's hearing and your commitment to this process. I'm also thankful to Chief Counsel Bob Ross, Lauren Green, the JNC, and the Joint Bar for their due diligence, dedication, and the, to the vetting process for this position as well. Thank you also to my witnesses, First Justice Erskine, Judge Brian Crane, and Clerk Magistrate Brendan Moran for taking the time out of your extremely busy schedules to be here today in support of my nomination. And I have to also thank my family, my friends, especially my children who are not here today because they're away on vacation, um, and my mother, um, and of course my husband, Michael, who's, he, who's not physically here as we now know, but is here in spirit. Throughout this process, and rightfully so, the focus has been on my qualifications for this position. I, fir I firmly recognize that qualifications of a juvenile court nominee are extremely important. I would not have applied for this position, and nor would I be sitting here today if I did not think I was qualified. But I do hope, in addition to my qualifications and my dedication to the juvenile court, you'll also consider my life experiences, because after all, those experiences have made me the person I am today. I recognize the massive responsibility a juvenile court judge has, and I fully appreciate how decisions made in the juvenile court have lifelong impact on the people that the court serves. And I especially appreciate those impacts, the impact of those decisions on our most vulnerable population, our children. I strongly believe that a judge not only needs to have a temperament in the knowledge and the law, but also has to be able to be empathetic and compassionate in order to carry out the role successfully. In a, in a perfect These qualities, the qualities that are, these are qualities that are developed over time and it's through different life experiences that have made, that, I, that have been part of my life that have made me who I am today. I would not be sitting here today if it weren't for the unconditional love and support that I've received from my parents, Jesse and Eileen. My father is here today. My mother is kind enough to be away with my children, watching them on a beach today. My parents have been married for over 50 years, and their dedication to each other and to me and my two siblings is beyond admirable. I grew up in Rosendale uh, for quite some time, and then ultimately in West Roxbury. I watched my parents work, um, work extensively in order to provide us with a lovely home, and they also provided us with a strong education. 
My parents taught me that extremely hard work and a strong work ethic and perseverance can pay off. Both of my parents came from humble beginnings. My father was one of five children and second generation um, uh, from a family that came from Italy. My mother was one of seven children and she was first generation of Irish descent. My parents taught me early on how important an education was. I watched my own father, or at least knew about the fact that in order for him to get his education, he had to attend school for 12 years in order to get a degree in electrical engineering. And he went 12 years nights while working full time. He did this for us, his family. In the meantime, my mother had given up her career at the phone company to stay home and raise me and my siblings. But she worked weekends and nights in order to help continue to provide for us as well and support the expenses related to our private education. In addition to a strong work ethic, my parents have inspired me in so many other ways. They've taught me innumerable life lessons and values. I'd be here for days if I were to try to list all those values and lessons that they passed on to me. The first thing on that brings through for my everyday life, first and foremost, is to, try to treat others the way that I want to be treated, to always stay true to myself. They also taught me that sometimes life throws curveballs. And in that same vein, they taught me that it's what you do with those curveballs that counts. And that's what has helped me build character throughout my years, not only in representing children and families in the court, but also on a personal level. That latter life lesson was the one that became absolutely invaluable to me when my daughter got diagnosed with leukemia and my husband one year later was diagnosed and then a year later died. As previously indicated, my parents have been married for over 50 years and their love for each other has always been an inspiration to me. I can say too that I was blessed in meeting my husband. I met him when I was 15 and I was married nine years later and he and I spent 30 years together. And I was by his side at the point of his untimely death due to cancer. I don't say this or tell this story to elicit any level of sympathy, but to make abundantly clear that it's these life experiences that have led to me to have a greater awareness and understanding that when you walk into a room and you meet different people, you have no idea the life that they've lived, the crosses that they bear, or what they've been through. Notwithstanding the fact that this was a horrible tragedy for me and my three children, Braden, 17, Ryan, 15, and my beautiful daughter, Madeline, nine, they are his legacy, and I feel blessed to have them by my side. Again, I don't say this and tell this story, and I didn't need anyone to die in my family, and I didn't need a diagnosis of leukemia to be very aware of the fact that everyone brings to the table their own personal life experiences. And so I'll use that, and I promise that I'll use that perspective and those life lessons if given the opportunity to be on the bench. Thank you. Very well done. Uh, would you introduce your father and your best friend? Sure, I will do. Okay. Uh, my father is Jesse Downing. He's here today. As I indicated, my mother Eileen is in Marshfield hanging out with my three beautiful children. I couldn't rip them away from their vacation. Um, and my dear friend, Liz Bowers, I've known her since I was about eight or nine, mm -hmm. and our relationship started then. Um, I used to babysit her children. I, it's just very important that I know that she's a palliative care um, nurse practitioner. And I'm blessed, first and foremost, to have her as a dear friend, but when everything was going on with my husband, I can't tell you the invaluable support and love that she gave me and my family. Thank you very much, Councilor Devaney. Your time starts now. Um, I'm, I'm getting emotional here. So good to see you. I do want to say publicly that um, uh, this council times your hearing, and you have from 9.30 to 10.45, one hour and 15 minutes, we're having someone committed at 10.45. I've made a motion that we only have one hearing, I want to be those counselors, but seven to one. 
And um, now we've got about 13 minutes. The other thing is I'm timed because I asked too many questions, so we're going to be timed. So I first want to say to you that um, meeting with you was such a pleasure. And I cried then, and you made me cry again. And uh, I have to say that uh, you are an amazing person. You are an amazing lawyer, mother, daughter. Um, I can't say enough. And um, shortly after you had got this position, your husband dies. And I know what that does for you and your children. I've been widowed 22 years, and I know. And I, I just, you, you have amazing strength. And I can't, and I usually don't show my hand, but I can't think of anyone more qualified to be on the juvenile court that I have had before me. Juvenile court is especially important to me, and I will not vote for anyone who hasn't dedicated their whole legal career with juveniles. And um, I had a little experience. I volunteered a year in court with juveniles on probation. It took a while to get their trust. I, I saw them one on one. And it was a great experience for me, my children, to see how juveniles, the sad part of their lives. And I met with a teenage girl whose mother was a prostitute. She didn't know where Bada was. I used to lock her in the room when she went out for the night, so I won't go into all of them. So I really understand what it is, and, and I will not give this as a consolation prize to someone, and you have it all. The thing that impressed me was that not only that, but you have been on uh, chief welfare juvenile delinquency cases, but the thing is that you have participated in programs, Norfolk County, case flow management team. So you're looking for solutions for these addicted and alcohol kid, and kids that are physically and sexually abused and to come up with solutions and to be on the juvenile court uh, initiative team. So I want you to talk about that. But I first want you to talk about your writings. I, you know, it's sad. You know, we grew up with mothers. You know, we trusted our mothers. They were protected. But things have changed and not for the good. Now, I want you to tell us, and so you, you have great writing skills. Tell us about that um, unfit mother and tell us about that writing. Uh, certainly. Um, that was a, an appellate case where I was, uh, I represented um, two young boys. And the underlying case that was before the trial court, the trial judge terminated the mother's parental rights. And as you're probably with your mother, my uh, father has a right to appeal it. Um, that case went up on appeal. I represented the two children in that case. Um, and the argument before the appellate court, um, basically, paraphrasing and simplifying a little bit, the argument was that mom did not have to abuse the children. Because in that particular case, it was the um, it was new boyfriends that had been in and out of her life and they were abusing the children. So there was a small history of abuse that her children suffered for many years. Mom appealed and was basically arguing that because she didn't conduct the abuse that she should have, she should not have had her rights terminated. And there were other um, supplemental arguments that came in as well that um, she put forth, but that was, that was basically the crux of the case. Um, one of the little boys uh, that I represented had suffered from, I believe it was 21 fractures um, to his body, and I think he was only four or five months old, and he needed surgery to repair one of his um, his leg. Um, so those facts were, you know, obviously it's always excruciating um, to read them, um, but my role is to, to advocate for them and what their position was. And because they were children, I could substitute the judgment. Um, so he was an infant, and I sub substituted my judgment and put forth a position that the mother's rights should um, remain terminated and not be um, overturned. You know, I wish there was a law to prosecute these mothers who are drug addicted and alcohol addicted and their babies come into this world suffering and in pain and for the rest of their lives they have health problems and uh, you see a lot of those, don't you? Certainly, yes, a lot of substance. Um, There's no solution for that, is there? I wish there were. No, but you have worked with indigent people who don't have any means. Mm -hmm. 
I love that, and the pro bono. Uh, you know, it's just heartbreaking. I don't know how you could do it. I don't know, I, I really, in my view, going into the juvenile court, I, I couldn't do it um, if I had the skill. But we think of a, a one month old baby, you've had all kinds of cases that have been abused. Uh, it's just incredible to me. And, um, and I don't think there's enough punishment. I don't think there's enough punishment for people who abuse children. I really don't. But especially mothers, there's got to be a law that, to say that when you have ruined this life of this child, you know, that there should be some punishment. But that's that's my opinion. Tell me about um, Jerry and Noah. Uh, uh, was it Jeremy and Noah that you had the, the two boys? And um, I can't even imagine, even back to four months old. So why don't you tell us that? Um, Council, that was that that was the same appellate case. So Jeremy and Noah, um, they were the ones that suffered the abuse at the hands of many men that were in and out of the home. Um, and the baby was the one who had the 21 fractures and needed surgery. And the termination flat. You see a lot of the children, thank God there are grandparents that are able and loving that take them over like this one month old baby and you looked into it to see that they thrive. Oh, yeah. you a lot of cases like that. Yeah, so I that case was um uh, Sean. It was with regards to Sean, just the first name is what I'll use. Um yeah, he was born when he was I think he was a month old and um, there was a domestic dispute in the house and the baby was found on the bed um, with needles. Um, hypodermic needles um, and the father had um, overdosed and so the child was removed from the home um, and I, I was assigned to work with with the baby. Um, I believe that if at all possible when a child is removed there should always be a kinship. Um, the priority should be a kinship placement with family and for for I don't know the reason why I put the baby in with the foster, foster family immediately. And so I advocated for him to get to the grandmother as quickly as possible. Now, tell us about those two programs you're, you were in, because I think that adds so much to your ability um, that you have tried to find solutions to these things. Certainly. So when I was, while I was still practicing in North Fork, I was on the bench bar committee. Um, uh, Judge McCallum had asked several attorneys um, to join the, at the time, it was a case flow management team. And I think it was a precursor to, to the Pathways Initiative um, by Chief um, Nectum. And the ultimate goal was to take a really good look at the type, the care protection cases and what was coming before the court and whether or not there are ways that each county could find specific ways to try to expedite those cases so that children weren't, um, forgive the term, but you know, flopping around in the foster care system for lengths of time that would obviously be contrary to their best interests and not giving them the permanency that they deserve. And you know, when you work with these indigent um, clients, I mean, for them to go through the juvenile system, it has to be horrendous for them. You know, so I, I thank you for, for all of that. Um, and the other thing is that um, people don't realize what happens to these children who have been in such horrendous situations, drug addiction, alcohol, and I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't think you have. I don't know. But I know that you're working on programs for solutions, and I thank you for that. I hope you'll continue. Um, I think um, I wanted to tell you that I talked to uh, Police Chief Carmichael. He could say enough about you, and he did send a letter. And um, he came from Walpole, but now we've got him in my district. He's in Newton, and uh, we love him. And he just couldn't say enough about you, working with you, and what you have done. So um, I just wanted to mention that. But, um, you know, this whole opioid epidemic, you know, um, it's, you know, the babies addicted, lifeline health issues, um, you know, mothers abusing their children. Uh, mothers, it, it breaks my heart. They will allow the boyfriend to be torture, rape, kill their children, and still will support them. You've seen them go to court, and they're going against this man who threw, was that the alcohol? Oh, um, she was burned. There was someone that was burnt and she blamed herself that she had been smoking or something. It was actually the boyfriend. Yeah. 
but I think that was within the, the appellate case as well. Yeah, but I mean, she had older kids and they had suffered abuse with other men. Um, and the, the argument before the appeal court or what I put forth was that the, the, um, her past actions and this pattern of behaviors is what would um, allow the judge to uphold the, the termination of her parental rights. So they go to court against the boyfriend of a husband and then they reverse their, I, I don't know how you can deal with them as a judge, but um, I, I just, you know, you are the whole person. I just think, um, and I have been in touch with um, one of the judges in the juvenile court for the past year, begging. And, you know, people think we have such authority. I wish I could. I wish I could do that. But it isn't that way. We have to wait till that person comes before us. And this has been a long wait, and it was really worth it. And I, I thank you for the time that you gave me. It was really, I can't tell you. It, and to have your dad here, I mean, it could be better than that. And your witnesses were great. So, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't show, I don't have a poker face. I've been smiling since I first met you on this, crying a little so. So, but thank you for all your time. Thank you. And congratulations. Councilor Duff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really enjoyed my time talking with you. Um, I, I wasn't planning on, on talking about some, some of this addiction stuff, but as one who's who's worked with addicts in a professional manner and setting, I'm, I frankly am very disturbed by what the previous counselor said and want to go back and um, yeah, talk to you a little bit about your understanding of addiction and um, you know how, how it impacts people and why they do some of the things they do when they're addicted. Just generally, can you share with me, what do you think addiction is? And sure. um, it, when I first started, um, it was, to me, early on in my early years, um, addiction was kind of like a black word. It was just, you, you, you were addicted. Um, and you never looked at it as a medical condition. Um, but over the years, I, as I work with so many children and families and parents who, um, have suffered from addiction and substance use disorders. Um, my take on it has completely changed. Um, I look at it as more of a, a medical issue that needs to be treated. Uh, I could not answer as to what would be the best way for people to, to approach it, but I don't think that what we're doing now is working. Um, um, because I see the same issues come up over and over again when it comes to substance use disorders. Um, and, and to just elaborate, I'm also, I've always been well aware of the fact um, that addiction isn't just standing on its own and by itself. There's oftentimes mental health, health issues that precede it um, and things that might build up to it. And so there's oftentimes a dual diagnosis and so many other pictures that need to be considered with regards to substance use disorders. Yeah, the comorbidities are really, you know, in the medical profession, um, which was the setting that I was in, um, are often more complicated. You know, just the chicken gun before the egg. Who knows? When, when a mother is addicted, she's clearly self-medicating. Right, the mother. On someone for their addiction. I mean, it doesn't absolve them. I've held babies in the NICU going through this nothing. And we may have thought about this. It's an incredibly disturbing yet powerful experience. But we need to be clear in this chamber um, that we can't blame the act. And it's, it's an addiction, it's a disease. And um, sometimes the disease causes people to do horrific things. So I, I really, after hearing what was said, I, I really feel very strongly that I have to sort of counter it because it's dangerous, in my opinion, to, to blame an addict for the behavior. It doesn't absolve them of their behavior. It never does. I mean, I, I'd be curious what the judges and the but, um, but it is a very strong, strong disease. 
And with opiates, with heroin, you don't take heroin. Heroin takes you. Take it once and just throw up and get sick. I take it twice. The third time you are addicted. I am not a conspiracy theorist by any stretch of the imagination, but when I, what I saw as a chaplain working with opiate addicts 12 years ago, before this was a du jour issue that everyone was suddenly caring about, um, it was clear to me because my other expertise was in hospice. So it was clear to me there weren't enough dying people in the world to be making that much oxycodone. It's clear to me that half of the profit was clearly, at least half of it coming from the street. Your addicts tell you they don't want to go to Florida because it's so easy to get oxycodone done there because senior citizens are selling it. So stop looking at their incomes. I mean, that is so crazy and upside down, but that is so real. No one wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I think I'm going to become a heroin addict. I think I'm, I think I'm going to get addicted to cocaine. Or, you know what, I think, I think alcohol is the addiction for me. You know? People don't do that. And it's imperative that the judges and judges in the juvenile court, again, it's not absolution. I know that people do horrific horrible, horrible things, and they need to be held accountable, but they also need to get well. I don't think anyone in this building, or most people in this building, or, in the, or citizens of the Commonwealth actually have the stomach to invest what it will take for people really to get well. Because I have very strong thoughts about how it should be done, and I don't know if I'm right or not, but I know what we're doing isn't necessarily working. That said, there are programs that are working. The ANGEL program up in Gloucester, where I'm from, the PARI program, those work well. Um, the, um, I, I think it's Star House up in Salisbury. That's a great facility. You know, I saw my addicts that I work with know there were certain places they wanted to get to. Because they knew if they could get there, they could maybe get better. But but we need to be very clear when we talk about this that the survival rate, the clean survival rate of an opiate addict for life is 15%. 15%. Now you may be sailing for 20 years, but we all can pick up the tabloids and see which you know famous person has suddenly overdosed on heroin after 20 years because the longer you're off it the more dangerous it is anyway i'm sorry to go on that that tune on that i really need to know that you really get what addiction is I do I and do. that we can't be blaming mothers because hey listen they didn't get pregnant by themselves you know i was raised you know in a certain church where they thought that could happen but I think biology has taught us it doesn't. Um, there are men involved when women are pregnant. And are they being held accountable to the same standards? I mean, this is a huge issue today, right? Because Roe has fallen. And I don't know, do you expect that you will have anything to do with juveniles coming in that might be asking for abortions? I mean, would, you could possibly be the judge on call, I suppose. Correct. The, the juvenile court doesn't have actual jurisdiction over those Correct. cases. That's a, the maybe they call Mary Mo cases, and yes. a 16-year-old um, is seeking an abortion and doesn't have parental consent. Um, those cases go to the superior court. Mm -hmm. um, a circumstance that could arise where I'd have to deal with that issue is if, if I am on judicial recall uh, right. response. Um, and it's, it's something that would need to be decided. Um, I haven't heard of it happening often, but it doesn't mean that it can't happen. So I'm very much aware of the fact that it that would be an issue. Making, are you able, able to say to us today that regardless of whatever your personal or religious beliefs are, that you, you understand the separation of powers and separation of church and state? Absolutely. And can make those decisions objectively for what would be the best health for that child. Without a doubt. 
Absolutely. And, and so will you say to me, I will uphold a woman's right to choose? I will absolutely uphold a woman's right to choose. And, and the right to have complete autonomy over their body. And right to have complete autonomy over their body without okay. any doubt or reservation. Because it's, in, it, it, it's important. And, and again, since we're on the record, if you can't do that, if you refuse yourself, that's okay. But you can't have it both ways. Sure. We're not King Solomon. We're not splitting babies anymore in this country. There is no more settled law. Um, thank you. Um, sorry to, I know I came off kind of stern, but, but addiction is a real, real serious issue. And to be victim blaming, the victim sometimes is the addict, even though they've committed the crime. They're a victim themselves. So for people in this chamber to not get that, I find mind-boggling and disturbing because I've been here 10 years. So um, I, I'm sorry, I just, I really felt like I almost had to correct the record because I think what was said previously was frankly outrageous, absolutely outrageous, and a complete... Um, display of ignorance in the real meaning of that word, not in, a, not in a pejorative way, but in the meaning of the word of not understanding what this issue is. And this issue will intersect and probably intersects in your work every single day. I'm grateful that you are willing to step up and serve the Commonwealth because you have been through your own, you know, dark night of the soul. It, every day, all of you who serve in our juvenile courts and in many of our other courts are seeing this. And it's one of the reasons I also ask, do you have a strong personal and professional and spiritual, and I don't mean religious, I mean people like your friend who hold you up, support system? Because you have and will continue to see horrific things. I do. I do. I have a, an extremely strong circle of friends. Um, my family, um, yes, my children inspire me as well. Um, in addition to that, my community that I live in is, is unbelievable in ways that way. Um, and then over the years, you, you learn ways to, to find ways to cope with the horrific cases and how to handle them. And, it, and for our judges who are here today and our clerk magistrates, I implore you that if you don't have these in place, or even if you do, check in with it. Because we live in a very contentious world today. And there may be a time where you make a decision and it doesn't go how we think it's going to go. A person commits a crime, something horrible happens, a, a, a child dies. A child dies. Nothing worse, right? But it's not done with malice. Not, I don't think there's anyone in the court that acts with malice. However, that's not how the world judges you today. And the press is brutal, and social media is brutal. People are brutal. The civility is gone. Um, and I have to check myself, frankly, with, with some of this stuff, because you get so hot, you get so angry. But I, I think it's really important that our judges are have those things in order for themselves, because you have a very, very difficult job, very difficult job. And I do thank you for, for stepping up and applying. Um, I know we, we, are, we have adopted a system more like the U.S. Senate. You know, this, this timing is, does not come from nowhere. It, it comes to have some order, and it's worked quite well. So I'm sure I'm coming up on my time, but um, I am co I'm concluding my comments for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, and just, just for the record, every councillor has the same amount of time. Councillor DePaul. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Dunn. Good morning. Um, I, everyone I've spoken to about you has wonderful things to say about you. People who reached out to me who I've not connected with yet have also indicated positive things about you. Um, and we've been waiting a long time to get someone in this seat in this term. Um, so I don't have any questions beyond that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hurley. Yes, good morning. Um, and a long drive in this morning to get here. Yeah, just so you know, the FedEx truck broke down on the Massachusetts Turnpike. So instead of going 65, I was going between 0, 10, and 20. 
from um, what the heck is the the last the, the the exit just before where the big mall is? Somebody help me. Natick. Natick. So it's from Natick in until we got past it. It was a really fun trip. Um, I just want to um, first of all say we talked and. You were one of the easy ones because um, I got calls from people. I made some phone calls and checked with some of the juvenile judges. Um, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I pray to God that your child is okay. Um, tough, tough road to hoe, no question about it. Um, I would indicate that I was, um, before I got here, I was listening. And Judge Erskine's um, lecture on juvenile court law was just great. Um, when I first started practicing law, I knew the one place I didn't want to be was juvenile court. In Springfield, you'd go in at nine o'clock, and you were lucky if you got out at two or three in the afternoon for one case. Um, so uh, I'm glad to hear of all the reforms. That I'm going to go practice in juvenile court. It's not going to happen. But um, I think you're going to be an incredible judge. Uh, it's not what you do the, the you know year before you get interviewed for the job. It's what you do every day in every courthouse with every person, with every lawyer, with everybody in the court personnel. Um, my father taught me a long time ago that it's not the judges that run the show. It's the court officers who can get you a, a little note to the clerk. It's the assistant clerk who realizes, oh, you've got to be in three courts. Okay, I'll help you out. Um, and um, you've done it with everybody. And that shows that you're just a truly good person who has empathy, good judgment, great work ethic, and the temperament that's needed, especially in juvenile court. So I thank you for applying, uh, and I think you're gonna do a great job. Thanks very much. Thank you, Counselor, I appreciate that. Counselor, I have three minutes on your rule. I just wanted to say, I, was, uh, I didn't mention that um, you've had hundreds of cases as a solo practitioner, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, that all the cases you've had for child welfare, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's very important. Do you know assistant clerk magistrate right to a judge? And that means a lot. So experience and your compassion and, and helping people. So uh, the question I wanted to ask is, um, and in private, when we met privately for that long time, I did ask you, do you think that the age should be increased in the in the juvenile court? I do not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, what do I know? But I just felt they're overworked now. And um, to me, I'm concerned the juvenile um, crime has increased. These mass killings. A young people, and so I mean, I mean, what is your? Well, you have no solution to it, but do you see that that the crime is increasing with juveniles? I mean, serious crimes. I mean, I've seen it on the news nationally, but I mean, our our courts are pretty steady with the amount of cases that come before us. We're, I mean, we're really busy um, doing the public hearing. We're all learning every single day. Sometimes you have five, seven, ten a day. Um, so it, it's it's. See, I, I can't sit here and say that it's in business started. Pretty steady and the numbers have remained pretty much the same, at least from my perspective. I just wanted to um, put on the record hundreds and hundreds of cases and I was remiss in not mentioning it. And, um, you know, I echo uh, my colleague, Councillor Hurley, I, I couldn't be more happier than we need you. And it's it's been a long wait. Thank you. I just want to... I did not hear your response to Councillor uh, Devaney's question about raising the age. I, I don't think we should. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, to follow up on that. Uh, what's your reasoning on not raising the age? 
part of it is because of how busy we are. Um, the other part of it, for in my mind, after working with um, uh, a lot of kids in DYS, physically in DYS, I, I worked with um, kids that were committed to the Department of Youth Services for many years as well. I, I just raising the age and having. Um, I, I know it might sound weird, but having that that age group also in DYS with other kids, I just think that there's there's just this fine line um, with that, um, and I just think the courts are just so um, busy as as it is. I, I that's really my reasoning why. And well, it be raised. seems to me that if, it, if it's just because of busyness, then we need the legislature to give us more judges. Yeah, I mean, nice so now, I, it would, I would question whether or not we could give them the services that we provide to them now. I mean, we possibly. let's assume in a perfect world, uh, we could do all of that. If you could actually do it, then, then perhaps, but I'm not sure, you know, then where, where does that line stop? Do you go to 19, 20, 21, 22, where, where does it go? Well, do you believe in the studies that have been done that show that a juvenile mind, especially a male juvenile, is not fully developed until the age of 25 or 26. I've read the science on it and I can't dispute it. Um, I think when you're utilizing the science that, that backs that, I, I do believe it, but I also think that when you're a juvenile, um, I put it in my application, I spoke about it. Um, what's so special about that you get to take a look at the whole person and there's so many other aspects besides just their age or the, the brain development or some of the things that come to mind for me. So when I'm sitting and doing clerk's hearings, I'm always looking to try to figure out who's this person, what are they all about, what kind of supports they have in place. The age doesn't play as much of a role, um, but I always consider that. Couldn't you do that with somebody who was 22, just as well as somebody who was 18? I, I think I, I, I could. I just, I wonder at what point, you know, how do you just keep on going? At what point do you, I think, this, I think the studies show its uh, development isn't fully done until the age of 25, 26. So I guess that's where you probably say uh, the minds are, are fully developed. I think females develop earlier than females. But uh, so to me, we punish somebody who's 21, his mind isn't developed, he makes foolish decisions, or she does. And uh, you know, they end up going to state prison. They end up going to a place where they're probably going to be abused. And it uh, seems to me that we should be a little more kind to those who aren't, who have the developed mind. But anyway, anyhow. Um, on the issue of crime going up or down, it's my uh, view having, from what I read anyway and study, is that the crime rates in the United States have been going down since about 1996. And they haven't really gone up. But I think people think they do because we see a steady diet on news channels of crime, crimes that continually are played in front of us. And crime sometimes that I, I listen to and I go, well, Jesus, 30 years ago, this wouldn't even be a news story. It was some local area that was a crime, but it wasn't the, you know, all that serious of a crime. And it's getting played throughout the nation on these 24-hour cable channels. People keep watching it and saying, boy, a crime is everywhere. But in truth, from anyway, my, my perspective, this crime really is going down. Less crime is being committed now than ever. Less serious crimes, too. But we hear about people who take an AR-15 and shoot up mass, mass killers. And we, in our minds, say, oh, that's terrible. It must be happening all over the place. But it really isn't. Would you agree with that or no? I do agree with that. Yeah. Uh, the, the issue brought up about uh, addictions, it's the latest thing I have read about it is that about 80% or more of people who are now addicted to an opiate became addicted through a prescription that a medical doctor 
provided. And because of that, even taking it by the directions of the doctor led them to be addicted. And of course, once you're addicted to the opiate pills, it's only a matter of time before you are forced to go to the street heroin and fentanyl. I, I don't know why any medical doctor in this state, anywhere else for that matter, would ever prescribe opiate with the exception of somebody who is in the throes of a medical condition that is terminally ill. Ever prescribe that poison Anybody, anybody, knowing the death and destruction that it has caused in this nation and in our state, why it is even being allowed to be manufactured is beyond me. And as bad as the opiate uh, oxycontin um, um, addiction that has ravished our country, the pill makers and the drug companies then produce a substance that even is more addictive, fentanyl. And now that is being prescribed by medical doctors. My, in my view, other than terminally ill, any doctor that prescribes that should have his license taken away from him. Because it is taking an oath, the Hippocratic oath, that I will do no harm and knowing that that can, can cause somebody to go into the throes of addiction with all of the things that happen to those people. Uh, it's beyond me. It's, it's just beyond me. I'll give you a story about myself. I come from a very uh, long and distinguished line of, of addicted people. I had a shoulder operation, and when I'm laying in the gurney, when I come to, the doctor gives me a prescription of oxycodone. I said to him, why would you give me this? He said, for pain. I said, okay, but you don't know anything about my background. Well, he said, you can take it by prescription. So, well, you know, and I know, that I might be the type of person that takes one pill. Because of that one pill, I become addicted. He said, you're right. I should have asked you some questions about your background before I prescribe. But most aren't asking those questions. And they're just as guilty, in my view, of what happened in this country as Big Pharma, Purdue Pharma, that got sued as rightfully they should have. But they had co-partners here. They had doctors dispensing it. They had uh, big companies dispensing it. Somewhere in, in West Virginia, Walmart, and it's in a town where there was um, not 100% accurate on this, but had a population of, let's say, 20 or 25,000. They dispensed like um, two or three million of these pills. They knew what they were doing. They did it for money. Doctors know what they're doing. They do it for money. And the more they prescribe, they still get benefits of going on speaking tours that are paid for by drug companies. Oh, I, I say that to you because it's easy for us to judge those that are heroin addicts or fentanyl addicts. It's easy. There but for the grace of God goes anybody in this room. And my, my sister indicated correctly, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'll become a heroin addict today. And there isn't anybody in this room, in my view, that if you were addicted to heroin, you would do anything to get that drug. 
anything yeah. that any yeah. other human being did, you would be capable of doing. That's the addictive quality of those drugs. Uh, so be kind to those that are addicted. They may have gotten addicted by a doctor they trusted. Uh, I think you got great qualifications. You had a lifetime of dedication to the juvenile court. Um, it's a special court, and I know how much work you have to do as a lawyer in that. It's amazing. It's, as I said, I, I, I go there now and then, but I, I, don't, I don't like going there only because of the amount of work you got to do. It's incredible. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, I think your witnesses are, are, are very good. I think the challenges that you overcome and are still going through makes you the woman you are. And I think you'll be compassionate and kind to those that come before you. You know, any damn fool judge can lock people up and put them in jail or house or in the juvenile detention center. It takes a judge with kindness and compassion to figure out how to treat people and make them better citizens. Uh, we'll vote on you next week. Thank you very much. Meeting is over.